All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am with a very special guest today. We have John Giordano. John is an expert in the treatment of addiction and the founder of the National Institute for Holistic Addiction Studies. He's the author of Proven Holistic Treatment for Addiction and Chronic Relapse, and his most recent book is the acclaimed How to Beat Your Addictions and Live a Quality Life. He's contributed to over 65 research papers with his close friend and colleague, Dr. Kenneth Blum, discoverer of the addiction gene. Their papers have been published in peer-reviewed medical and scientific journals, such as Medical Hypotheses, BMC Cases Journal, quite a few others. Um, in the pursuit of organizing and developing new holistic treatments for addiction, John founded the National Institute for Holistic Addiction Studies, a think tank and research facility where world-renowned scientists and addiction professionals conduct clinical studies in developing evidence-based new and alternative treatments for addiction. John, I could keep going, but welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So I, I'm curious to hear your, your kind of, uh, you know, if, you, if you're comfortable talking about your kind of personal journey, kind of going into the whole uh, sort of addiction field. It, from, from what I had seen, it, it sort of revolved around a personal story of overcoming addiction. Uh huh. Yes. I, well, I'm coming up on 36 years in recovery. And when I first started, I didn't think I was going to have 36 minutes. I didn't even know what, what recovery was about, number one. Uh, I'm also a grandmaster in the martial arts, and national karate champion and all this other stuff. But, you know, I didn't pay attention to what the disciplines that I had. And I got, wind up being, uh, testing out, um, I started with acid, and then I, I, I graduated to marijuana, and then I graduated to different pills. Um, I was a feel-good junkie. Whatever felt good, that's what I did like typical addicts. And uh, to, to make the story short, um, I used to do, I used to deal drugs and I used to do collection work for the smugglers. Uh, I did a lot of different things. And I, I have no felonies, I have no any of that. Um, it's kind of ironic where my life winded up because I'm also a chaplain for the police department today, uh, being a therapist and a traumatologist, I work with our wounded warriors and I work with police officers that have been in shootings and I do research. And I also was part owner of a treatment center. But moving backwards, what happened was my, I was getting out of control like most of us do. And my family did an intervention on me. And the funny part, the people that did the intervention, some of them were drug dealers. It was my, my family's like a mafia type family. I just finished my, um, my new book, um, and I'm coming out with that one soon, uh, from the kid from the South Bronx who never gave up. And um, so I'm writing my life story. And uh, my family was like a mafia type family, and my father was a drug dealer. Uh, my uncles were hitmen. Uh, I, I, I kind of lived a soprano life. And um, here I am, I go to treatment, because my mother said she'll never talk to me again. And that wasn't like my mom. And anyway, I wandered up in treatment. I thought it was all baloney. Uh, I, I wouldn't even get high. I used to say I wouldn't even get high with people like this. So anyway, to cut it short, I, I had a spiritual awakening in treatment. Um, and then when I came out, I wanted to help other people. And uh, my life started to change from there. And it was a very difficult journey, as most of us addicts have that. And I only went to the ninth grade. Um, I didn't have an education. So when I came out and I opened up treatment center, well, the only thing I knew about treatment is that I was in one. But um, I started with my first treatment center. And um, I was living, I was homeless because I got divorced from my wife. Um, and a friend of mine lent me a room to go live in. It was uh, had two beds. We had a, a warmer. I had a a jar where I used to put coins when I had coins. And um, I went on from there. And uh, it's a whole story about how I opened up my first treatment center with my doctor and my therapist. And, and then I got betrayed. And it goes on and on and on and on. But the, the, the move it all the way forward, my last treatment center that I opened up, I started with $300. And um, we sold it in 
in uh, 2012 for 45 million. Now, if you would have told me that what would have happened back then, I would have probably punched you in the face. They could let you try to make fun of me. Uh, I was fortunate to have wonderful partners. Um, and uh, we did a lot of good stuff. And we were in business for like almost 20 years uh, doing all of that and then lecturing and then doing the science part. And I went back to school and I got my degrees and I, I did all the things that you need to do to, to move forward in life. And uh, every chance I get to talk to people about recovery and about what's going on. And I learned that recovery is 60 years behind the times. Uh, we keep doing the same kind of things over and over again, expecting different results. They say that the relapse rates are really high, treatment doesn't work. Well, they're not all wrong. Based on the, the model, treatment doesn't work very well. Now, it works for some because it worked for me, and it works for maybe a third of the people, but now we got two-thirds that are dying out there. Right. And, you know, the reason why they don't work is because it's supposed to be a medical model, and it's not. It's a psychological model. We're not looking at co-contributing factors to addiction. Like if you have a low thyroid, you're going to have depression and anxiety. If you're predisposed for addiction and you have the addiction gene, you're going to gravitate towards a substance or a behavior that's going to get you out of that pain. Tell me a little more about the addiction gene. Okay. Dr. Blum and uh, uh, I think it was Ernie Noble, they found this gene, the DRD2, uh, ALE1 variant gene. And it's one of the genes that are the, uh, the main gene that drives all this for dopamine. What we call addiction is what Dr. Blum coined the phrase is uh, RDS, reward deficiency syndrome. See, we don't look at it as, or oh, you do alcohol, or you do drugs, or you do sex addiction, or you do gambling addiction, or you have shopping addiction. What we look at it as a lack of dopamine. And people have a different footprint, so they gravitate towards different substances or behaviors that cause them to be addicted and cause their life to turn into a nightmare. And what we developed over the years, of uh, Dr. Blum developed uh, amino acid therapy in the gene test, which is called the GARS test. And what that is, is they test you, your DNA, and they find out if you have the gene, if you have a mild, moderate, severe propensity for addiction, and then they see where you're deficient, and then they give you different nutrients to help you raise your dopamine. And most people say, well, how do you know that? Well, easy, we did uh, fMRIs, we did PET scans, CAT scans on the brain while we're giving with double uh, placebo testing, where people, nobody knew if you were getting the real stuff or the, um, they're not the real thing, the placebo. And we found out in the brain that it upregulates dopamine. You see, the and then we started therapy. Right, amino acid therapy. Okay. And then we looked at people's lifestyles. But well, we found out that people that smoke cigarettes are more apt to relapse than people who don't. Addictions, addictions, addiction. If one thing's controlling you, then the ability of something else to control you is readily available. Uh, then we looked at the gut, the microbiome, which they're now finally looking at, which is interesting, uh, which can cause autoimmune diseases. But most people don't realize that serotonin and dopamine, 90% of it is manufactured in your gut, which goes up to what is known as the vagus nerve into your brain. And that's how you get your dopamine and your serotonin. So there's a lot of stuff. If you want to ask me more questions, I can go into I can speak forever on it. So you know. Yeah. Well well one of the things I'm curious, so so with with your center, did you would you guys regularly test people for this gene? And did that like affect kind of therapeutic interventions, like how you how you well, recovery? Yes. When we did the research at my facility, and what we found out is a lot of interesting things. People with higher education more were less more apt to to relapse, uh, people that um, uh, had different uh, heavy metal toxicity, you know, mercury, lead, antinomy, uh, all these different heavy metals interfere with neurotransmission. Okay, so what happens is that the neurons don't connect properly and it mimics bipolar disorder, ADD, ADHD, 
and things like that. So you have to chelate that out in order to start helping the process of helping people. See, it's not just the psychological. Yes, there's trauma. Yes, there's inner child work you have to do. Yes, there's all these other psychological approaches are all very important. And then going to a self-help group, going to therapy. Yes, all that's paramount. You have to do that. But if you don't fix what's going on medically in the body, all that's for naught. First of all, treatment's too short. All right, 28-day model was based on Minnesota model, which was for really based on alcoholics. Now, most people are cross-addicted, and, and the substances that people are using are so highly volatile that the brain is just getting destroyed. Uh, I work with also Dr. Deborah Mash from the University of Miami School of Medicine. Matter of fact, she just retired. She's the leading expert on the substance called ibogaine. Are you familiar with that? I have heard of it. So it, it's from my understanding. What do you know about it? Uh, I believe so. It's a it's a psychedelic that that some of the treatment centers are starting to use to treat addiction, right? No, the treatment centers cannot use it here because not, it's not, a not in, one drug. Right, right. Not in this country. I think it was what I read was like so, Costa Rica or some. Okay. There, there's some centers yeah. like elsewhere besides the U.S. All right. Okay. Let me explain. I I'm one of the leading experts on on the clinical part piece. I began. I worked in St. Kitts with Dr. Mash for 12 years. And um, I was the only treatment center actually that took Ibogaine, I, I began clients in and treated them for a number of uh, you know, weeks and months. And the difference is Ibogaine clients, I began clients a different kind of client. Um, the, the, the problem with an Ibogaine client is they think they're well and they're not. What it is, what Ibogaine does, it resets your, your brain. It's like a reboot. It gives you the ability to have a certain amount of time, depending if you're uh, a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer, how your liver functions, to be able to not have cravings. We have an open mind to start getting information how to change the behaviors that you developed over time. So the difficult part was they thought they were well. They felt great. They didn't have any cravings. They said, well, I don't need anything. Well, that's not true because it took time to get sick and it takes time to get well. Treatment should be anywhere from 90 to 120 days, depending on the severity of the illness, not 30 days. And then under the current way of doing treatment, all right, a guy goes to detox, all right? He comes in, leaves detox. He's still, he's not really detoxed. He's stabilized. If you want to detox somebody, you do not put other toxins in, in the place of other toxins. So what they look like, what they look is for stabilization. Once they have stabilization, they say, okay, now you can go out into treatment. They come into treatment and their brain is still out for lunch. I know mine was. I don't even know what they were talking about half the time. And who can remember it anyway? So you're still out for lunch for the first two or three weeks. Your brain starts to recalculate itself and catch and listen to the information. Hearing is biological, but you have to listen to learn. So what happens is, is that about the third week of treatment, you finally maybe, maybe bond with a therapist, and then you have to leave. So aftercare is paramount, because you need time to heal. Your body is damaged by drugs and alcohol, not just your mind. So these are the things that we did. And another, another interesting treatment that we, we just touched on before we started recording was you mentioned that the use of hyperbarics. Can you talk to me a little about um, kind of what that is and, and why it's effective for, for treatment? Okay, well, here's the deal. We have to remember, do you believe drugs damage your brain, number one? Okay. Do you? Uh, right? There's certain, no disagreement there. Certain drugs, yeah. Certain drugs. Well, you drink alcohol for a while. You ever heard of a wet brain? Yeah, I mean, al alcohol is certainly one oh. of the most neurotoxic for sure. Uh, you ever see a brain that uh, on people that did meth? I have. They got holes in their brain like Swiss cheese. Because Dr. Dr. Uh, Nash was the head of the brain bank. Uh, if you see people on, on, on different drugs, you see different things in the brain. Brain gets, I promise you, the brain gets damaged. 
especially when you're putting toxins like that in your body. So hyperbaric is oxygen under pressure. Okay, and it turns into a medicine. Now, when it first started over 100 years ago, they used to use hyperbarics for the bends. They still do, by the way. When you go down very deep into the water, the nitric acid in your blood, you have to come up slowly. Then they put you in the tank for a few hours until you normalize, and, and then you can leave. All right? But they also found out that it heals wounds, which is interesting. And, and I work with um, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Harch, who is a pioneer in hyperbaric medicine out of Louisiana. And he and Dr. Williamson went to the Senate and they got approved for hyperbaric medicine for diabetics who were gonna lose their legs and their arms and so forth. And what they did was they healed the people instead of having their legs and their arms cut off. Now, they took it a step further and they worked with TBI cases, traumatic brain injury cases, because if we can heal a cut it also goes into your brain. So your brain now is getting healed also. So your brain is damaged, okay? So you use hyperbarics to help your brain. Amino acids are used to help upregulate dopamine so you feel good, okay? Then you have to look at other things. Uh, we found a lot of the, the addicts and alcoholics had low testosterone. If you have low testosterone, you have depression and anxiety. If you have a, 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 a thyroid, low thy thyroid, you have depression and anxiety. If you have leaky gut syndrome, H. pyloria, these are all gut issues. You have all these other co-contributing factors to your mood. So how do you stabilize somebody like that if you don't address it? Right, right. I mean, it's, it, it makes sense that holistic, yeah, looking at all the different sort of factors. Is that, so did you kind of like slowly sort of add these different elements on to, to sort of the treatment facility or like, and I'm curious like yeah. then also like how you saw, I guess, uh, recovery rates and, and relapse rates kind of getting affected as, as you implemented more and more therapies? No, we were doing research by third party. You see, here's the, here's the problem. If you're gonna do research, you can't do your own research because nobody's gonna believe you. You know, people tweak things, you know, to make them look good. All right, so you have to have a third party. So I hired Dr. Blum, and I hired another gentleman called Steve Schoenthaler. Steven is a researcher out of Stanford University in California. And he's the one that did the, the Sentinel research on adolescence with nutrients and diet changes, how he proved that through proper diet and proper nutrients, okay, he can decrease uh, the behaviors of adolescents. And, and, and that's a whole paper, peer review journal, the whole nine yards, which we know that it's true. When you have deficiencies, okay, in your body, your brain, your, your body's all connected. It's not your head walking around, you have it attached to a body. So if you don't eat properly, you don't exercise. So let's look at exercise. What we used to do is this. I used to teach them karate. So we gave them something to focus on so their brain can start functioning. This way they also got to do aerobic exercise. Now, what does aerobic exercise do? Well, number one, any heart patient, they tell you to exercise, okay? Same thing with, more, or same thing with, with uh, addiction. The reason why you need to exercise is real simple. Exercise improves dopamine. That's number one. It also deple it depletes stress. Now, you ever heard of a runner's high? Somebody running to get a running, right? Okay, so stress depletes dopamine. So you have to get rid of the stress so you don't keep depleting it. And then you have to fill it back up with the workout. So now you have to, we have that piece. And now you got the other piece is that you have to check for medical abnormalities that co-contribute to your addiction. Remember, addicts out there, look what they eat. We ate garbage, anything that's quick, frozen pizza, frozen this, I mean, a diet is terrible. Why do you think we have obesity and have so much cancer, processed foods, you got GMOs, you got all this crazy stuff that we're doing because we wanna make money and make food last longer. Don't you think that affects us? Yes. Absolutely. So if, you have, if you're predisposed for addiction, guess what? You're in trouble. 
Now, just because you have the gene for addiction doesn't mean you're going to be an addict because there's such a thing as called epigenetics. Now, epigenetics means the social environment can change the gene expression. Simple stuff. Um, any other questions? Because I can go on and on and on, but you know, it's, I want yeah. to get two way. Yeah, I mean, what what you're all of the stuff you're talking about makes so much sense as far as your kind of the approach to to treating addiction. I'm curious to hear why why you think that other what, as you said, like you know, sort of current treatment being like sort of sixty years behind. Like, why why do you think that there are still many so many like outdated treatment facilities and and why why aren't more facilities incorporating all of these different things? Great questions, and I give you a simple answer. It's called money. Real simple. Yeah. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Not that they treatment centers. And listen, the people that dedicated their work in treatment, some treatment centers aren't. Okay. Some treatment centers want to care about money, and it's like a, a warehouse. Okay. But there are good treatment centers out there. But the problem is, you have running a treatment center costs a lot of money. Okay. So that's with all the regulations. And what happens is insurance companies do not pay for alternative medicine, even if you have the research behind it. So what do you do? You, you, you can't do it. Most people don't realize uh, how bad it is in treatment. Okay. Number one, if you go to treatment and you have, you, you're suffering from depression, but of course you just stop drugs. Of course you're going to be depressed and have anxiety. If we don't give you medication, you can't be in treatment because you're not sick enough. So this is the, the, the dilemma treatment centers are in. Okay? And the funny part is, well, not funny, medication was only used for short-term intervention. Ah, but the pharmaceutical companies thought they can make money from it, so now it's a long-term affair. And the, there is not much research done on cross-pollination of different medications and the length of time that they're using it for. See, that's one of the big problems. That's why treatment is behind the times because they get no funding, okay? And they have to do the best they can. And aftercare, aftercare, we used to have it for life. Now, whether they, they came from another state or not, we used to use Skype, okay? We, most of the clients left, they went to a three quarter way house. That's where people live, all right, with all together that are doing their best to stay in recovery and where they, you know, where they have to drop urines and good, good three quarter way houses, uh, where they have to get a job, they have to go to meetings, they have to do what it takes to get recovery. You know, if you think about it, you're doing drugs for 20 years. You really think 30 days is going to fix you? Good point. Simple stuff. This is not right. I lecture now to doctors and scientists. And they look at, after my lecture, they all come around me and they go, you know, John, I, I, I can't believe we never even thought of this. I said, you know why? Because most people have tunnel vision. Whatever they're working on, that's what they're working on. They're not looking outside the box. See, our treatment center, we used to do acupuncture. It's only been around 5,000 years, okay? Uh, we did hyperbarics. We did amino acid therapy. We even did massage. And people say, oh, massage, making it fancy. What people don't really get is drugs are on a cell, in, in your body on a cellular level. So you need lymphatic massage to get that out of your body. Same thing with taking a sauna. We had colonics, which helps clear out the lower intestines because that's where a lot of opiates live. We did biofeedback, neurofeedback. We also checked for heavy metals. We also checked for allergies. Believe it or not, allergies can cause depression. And if you're predisposed for addiction, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to go to a substance or behavior that's going to make you feel good. So right. we did all those things. We did light therapy, sound therapy. We, uh, matter of fact, we did a poster presentation at the New York Academy of Science on how sound and light, okay, changes how the brain functions. Uh, they had a lot of people there doing it for autism uh, and, and things of that nature. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but the problem is, is that there's not enough research because research costs a lot of money. And you have to have what is known as an end game. How are you gonna make that money back? 
How are you going to make a profit? So most of these things go by the wayside at work. Right. So I, I, I'm interested then, uh, how are you able to, in, in your treatment center, how are you able to still, you know, be a successful kind of businessman, but also incorporate all of these really necessary treatments that, you know, I'm guessing it is probably a lot more expensive for you as we're talking about than if you were to just, you know, kind of give them some, some pharmaceuticals and say, you know, on your way, right? That's another, that's another very good question. And I can tell you how. You see... When you have people, you have kind of like you have power, okay? So what does that mean? Okay, we were there to help people. Could we have made a lot more money? Absolutely. But we even gave people treatment that when we didn't even have any money to even pay our bills. You know, we're in helping to save God. My kid almost died from this. I don't want to see anybody else's son or daughter die from this disease. And how we did it was when they came into treatment, we gave them four free sessions of whatever therapy, the alternative therapy they wanted. And then after that, if they liked it, they would pay out of their pocket, okay, a nominal fee, which would cover the cost of what we were doing. And also we would, they would buy the nutrients because addicts are feel-good junkers. They feel good, they want to buy it. So we would give them the nutrients. They would purchase them also. So what we did was we were able to at least make a, a little profit off of what we did but give a service that nobody was able to give. Simple. Right. But people don't want to bother doing all that. You see? So that's one of the problems. So you guys, yeah, you guys kind of differentiated yourself from all the other treatment kind of options. By, Listen, by... Uh, if you look, if you talk to people in the addiction field that know G&G, &G, Holistic Addiction Treatment Center, that was the name, before 2012. After 2012, the guy destroyed it. But he, he wound up closing down in three years. Hmm. And the thing, was, the thing ran like a clock. We had 147 employees. Now you gotta remember, we started with one employee, you're looking at him. All right, then we had two of my partner. And if it wasn't for my two partners, we wouldn't have been successful. It wasn't just John Giordano. You know, uh, my partner, Jerry, ran the business part. I designed the program, ran the whole program. My other partner, Gerald, which was his son, ran the internet. We used to get a thousand calls a day. Now we only had 62 beds. So what we used to do is sell the calls for a quarter of a million dollars a month. And that's how we made up for everything. See, we learned how to get different revenue streams, how to support the treatment center, still make money and do real quality care. Right. Yeah, no, was it's, it difficult? It, yes. It was difficult. But we did it. Right. That's awesome. Well, John, any any uh, last things before we uh, wrap up? Any Anything that we haven't touched on yet when it comes to just things people should know about when it comes to addiction or treatment, recovery? Okay, real simple. Get an exercise program. Start to eat as best you can better than you normally eat. Start with all the dairies and all the heavy processed foods, okay? Um, get, go to meetings. You know, people say, well, I don't go to meetings. I don't believe in meetings. Look, sit there. If you don't learn anything, you don't like it, don't go. Go to church. Go someplace. You need a self-help group somewhere. Go to church. I don't care where you go, okay? Whatever floats your boat. But you have to do something. You can't isolate and be alone because this disease is doing push-ups while you're sleeping and it's going to grab you. Well said. Well, uh, John, what, what, uh, what resources, if people are interested, were interested in what we're talking about, where would you direct them to either find more about your work or? They can go to holisticaddictioninfo.com and they'll see some of the research. They'll see some of the television shows that I've done. I write for magazines. Uh, they'll see all the different things and my phone number's on there if they want to call me. Awesome. Well, and if you guys enjoyed the show, go ahead and like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're Roscoe's wetsuit. And you can also find audio versions of the podcast available now on Spotify, Apple podcasts, iHeartRadio, and we're on Stitcher as well now. So go ahead and check us out whichever way you want. 
John, again, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, if they can get my new book, How to Beat Your Addictions and Live a Quality Life, it's not expensive. I think it's about $10 or $11. It's on Amazon. Uh, it'll really help you. Great. I'll put a, I'll put a link to that in the show notes.